All right, so today I want to talk about uh, just, I call it surviving the SIP. Let me pull up my screen sharing. It's pretty much if you, let's say you get on a set as your first day, especially on indie sets, uh, like what stuff that you should have, stuff, little things you should know. So these are stuff that you may already know, some things you think you know, but you might not know all the way through. So I just want to go through that. So if you get on a set and let's say, uh, okay. If you get on a set and let's say you have to get on as an electrician. So these are the basic two that you should have the outlet tester. You, the, this one, if you don't have it, it's not a big deal. If you do, uh, it'll make you look really good. So this is mine. Uh, so what you do is you just literally plug this into the outlet and then it tells you uh, if there's something wrong with it, especially if you have like a, Stinger that doesn't work, or you plug it, it was working, it wasn't. And then this one also has this end where you don't have to plug it in. You just you just press this black button here. And if there's electricity going through, it'll beep like that. So if I go away from electricity, it doesn't beep anymore. I think it's reading from my computer. So, uh, and then gloves. Usually, uh, when you're starting out, because uh, a lot of the time, you're not even getting paid that much anyways. So you don't need those fancy film gloves, film two gloves. When I started out, I just went to Home Depot and I just bought like gardening gloves. So I have some gloves here. So I, right now, I don't really use them because I just DP, but I carry a couple of gloves with me sometimes. This is an airy glove. Like if you don't have money, don't get this. It's kind of stupid. It's kind of useless. It's just the same as the other one. But I think it might be heat resistant, but it's not fireproof. Some of the expensive gloves are fireproof or heavy heat resistance. So I think if I remember correctly, this one's waterproof. So I get waterproof because if it rains, it kind of helps you. I actually got electrocuted a little bit <laughs> when I first started because I well, I didn't have gloves on and bare hand touching the body, so I'm not sure nobody's coming in. So any glove, when you're starting out, nobody's going to judge you. Like I've had, I have like union people wear like more shitty gloves than this, and they don't care because it's just to protect your hand, so little things like that. And a multi-tool, it could be, I've had people buy like $5 multi-tools. Uh, this is one of this is one of mine that my friend gave me. I don't know, like people in the industry, they like to buy really cool Leathermans, but it's not necessary. It's just in case you need something. Uh, I think somebody, oh, mom, hold on, let me get mom on here. Mute. Sorry, guys. Oh, I didn't know I could throw this down here. All right. Well, I guess I'll keep going while I'm always showing up. I don't have my needle nose plier anymore, but uh, that's good. Especially uh, if you're an electrician, sometimes you put a, a wire or like a grid into your light to cut down the light. It gets really hot and you need to pull it out. That's what we use to pull it out. Or if you don't have that, you can use this. So you should grab it like that so you don't have to touch it with your hand. Uh, Sharpie, labeling stuff, it's, you have no clue how useful a Sharpie is on set, like PAAC, whatever. Sometimes you need to label, a uh, cable is bad, you label that. Uh, on mute. Hey, monkey ears, sorry, how you mute it? Uh, yeah, I can hear you guys. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Cool. Uh, does anybody, oh. Do you have your video video on? Uh, give me a second here. So I'll keep going while you try that. Yep. Uh, oops, sorry. A sharpie, meter nose, multi two. Oh, knife. You can use any kind of knife. I like. I even have this cheap one. I forgot. I think this when I first started. Is like, I think I bought it for five dollar. So anything you can cut with, because you never know what you're going to cut. Uh, does anybody not know Hmong? 
Well, why don't you kind of introduce yourself quickly, like who you are, what you do, so people know you. Oh, sorry, sorry, I muted you. Okay. Okay. Hey, right. everyone. So uh, my name is Mong Bang. I'm a filmmaker in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, Ken and I actually knew each other a really long time ago. Ken and I back when we were in college, uh, we were the only two Hmong filmmakers in the state of Minnesota that was studying film at film school in Minnesota. So we kind of just kept in touch and did some projects together here and there. And then um, after film school, Kat decided that he wanted to go out to LA. And you know, my theory was that I didn't want to uh, uh, be a PA in Hollywood for the rest of my life, you know? So I figure, you know, I, I'll do the Jackie Chan, Jet Li, Donnie Yen, whatever uh, route where I just make my own film and hopefully I can sell it to Hollywood. So here I'm still in, trying to, you know, make my own films. And Kat and I have been in touch ever since 2000, probably two, 2003, Kat, maybe, or 2002. I think I know you for a while now. Yeah, it's too long. It's too sure. long. <laughs> I think one year longer than I know, Dua. Yeah. So. All right, cool. Thank you. So let me move on. Screwdrivers. Uh, so your multi tools can have screwdrivers too, but I try to carry just a fillet and a screwdriver. It's just for random things. And Allen wrenches, I carry a metric and American standard. And again, I bought these when I was first started. It doesn't have to be anything uh, fancy. Like I marked this one because this is the standard that I use all the time when I'm gripping. So I just kind of put a tape on it so I know. But these ones, like especially nowadays with like stuff coming out of China, back in the days when I first started, I never used these. But now, because there's so many random stuff coming out that you may or may not have to use these. So I carry that. And again, this set I bought for maybe $10. And measuring tape, again, you have no idea how much you need measuring tape on the set. It's just sometimes you, they just want to know how big the door is, little things like that. And I have a little pouch that, again, I bought from just Home Depot. So you can carry everything in it. It doesn't have to be fancy. When you get on bigger sets, people buy pouches that make specifically for movies, but it, to me, like it does the job, nobody cares. So, and I guess these are more for gripping, so I'll talk about clips later. So, do you guys have any questions about just basic tools for to be an electrician? All right, moving on. Oops. Cool. So, the tools of the grip are very, very similar. Uh, the only thing that you don't need for grip is, uh, oh, the only thing that you add to this is a hammer. Uh, for grips, you need a hammer. Uh, again, this is, I think I bought this at the dollars. No, not the dollars, but somewhere very cheap. And I also carry a mallet. This is not a requirement, but I carry it because sometimes when you, especially on low budget set when you first start sometimes you might tighten something too heavy too heavy and you don't want to break it with the hammer so i just use a mallet and i've had i've actually used this more than this so just little things like that and then tools for ac most likely when you start as an ac you're going to be a second ac so it's kind of similar but you do need a pen and a pencil with it uh, let me see if I can find my screwdriver. Uh, I don't have my smaller screwdriver, but this is actually my AC pouch. So AC pouch, I carry tape. The tape, it's good to have, but the thing to understand is that tape is expendables. So production, the producers, the production is supposed to provide you with tape, but everybody does come with tape when they work. If, if you can afford it, it's good to, to have it. If you can't, don't worry about it. If they give you shit for it, it just means they don't know what they're doing. And 
So and does I, the producer like uh, they provide that or the the the, the so typically on bigger sets, uh, typically on bigger sets, the ACs will bring their own, but it goes into their AC kit, okay. so that they pay for it. But on smaller sets, like especially when I shoot, I tell the I tell the producers, say, "Can you give me these tape because I don't want my ACs to be spending money on it." So yeah, they, I mean, I remember when we did my my short. I gave you some. I think I gave you some money for some. Yeah, you did buy some tape. Yeah. So. Uh, mm -hmm. And then with the AC, you carry the, especially as a second AC, uh, tape like this is okay, but usually you have a soft tape, so you don't cut people. This is not very soft, but this is another like just random tape that you can use that's not film made. So you don't have to get the expensive film equipment when you first start. Once you get bigger or get paid more, you can definitely get more. And there's no that pad. Like a laser measuring? Yeah, that's for uh, that's more for the first AC. Oh. Okay. Yeah, and but you a lot of second AC if you could afford it, you do you actually can have it. I actually just got one just from uh, just from Amazon. So there's one that's made for film. This is just a regular household one. Mm. So if you're serious about doing AC work, this is good. This is a good investment. But if you're just getting on set. They're just to uh, get to know people and like to eventually transition into directing or whatever, then I definitely don't recommend buying the laser one because it could get expensive. Like this one, I think like a hundred dollars. So not, it's really not worth it because you will never ever use it once you're not AC anymore. And even me as a DP, I don't use it. I just get it just because sometimes my ACs don't have it and I just provide it with them just a courtesy. So can you uh, define the difference between like an AC, a DP, uh, an assistant director in a sense for? Yeah. So uh, let's start with the assistant director. The assistant director, if you really think about it, is kind of like the manager of the set. Okay. The, the set, the schedule, they actually don't do any directing. The only directing that the uh, assistant director might end up doing is blocking the background. Okay. They might do the background, okay, you walk this way. At this moment, you walk this way when I kill you. Or like, hey, when you walk here, you have to go to the store. Like, that's probably the most directing that you do. But they're actually not directing. That's the kind of thing that uh, people misunderstand is that they think that if you want to be a director, or as a DV, as an assistant director, or a director, but you actually don't move up to be a director. The route of the assistant director actually moves up to become a producer if you eventually want to move up. So it's uh, it's a little different. And they technically, they don't work for the director. They work for the producers. And so I'll just check and see if anybody checked in. Oop. I don't know, as long as you, as long as you got muted. Okay. Yeah, I, I just like to mute myself. Yeah, I know, my, I, I my typing, typing or doing other stuff. <laughs> I thought my computer muted you. Okay, so you can mute yourself if you want. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's what the assistant director does. So the DP is in charge in a basic way. It's in charge of the look of the movie. They're in charge of the camera team, the grip team, the lighting team. But they work alongside the director, the uh, production designer, even the editor, to design the look of the film. And it really, you know, sometimes it's really depending on the project, because some projects, some directors are very specific. I want this look, I want this lens, I want this, I want that, and that's completely okay. So the DP's job is to execute that. But some directors, like the, this other director I work with, is like, hey, I trust you, whatever look you want to go for, but that doesn't mean that it's a uh, open book either he showed me some films he's like this is the films i wanted to look like but i trust you to make that happen so it's and then some directors are just like i just want to direct the actors everything else is on you i don't care and yeah and the other director who, who's like i said who knows the look like this frame is what i want here that's exactly what i want we're, we're not going to shoot past this line of dialogue dialogue so the DP's job is to execute that. And like the ACs, 
basically on a smaller set, you might not even have a second AC. Like I've done a lot of projects where I don't have a second AC just because they can't afford it. Like not even paying the second AC, they can't even afford to feed them. So we just don't bring them on like a PA or even a director just uh, does the slate. But the AC's job is really just the camera. That's what they call camera assistant. It's funny because the title is camera assistant, but it's AC assistant camera. So it's kind of reversible. So the first AC job is uh, to prep the camera with the second AC will support the first AC with that. But they prep the camera, they built the camera. Uh, usually if you're on a set that has money, you will have a day or two, sometimes a week to go and prep the camera because your camera might consist of 10 lens, maybe three different, three different zoom, five different primes. You might have this wireless focus for this, this wireless video for that. So they have to go and prep the camera, familiar, familiarize themselves with that. Sorry, I saw two notification here. Oh. So, uh, so they do that in the on set. The first AC's job is mainly the focus of of the shot. So everything the everything that you see that's in focus that's all on the first AC. And really good first ACs, even when you're not sure even when you're setting up, everything's in focus. Everybody has to be able to see it. Especially nowadays with Video Village, because sometimes you're setting up and the director might be, hey, I don't see that, or whatever. And the second AC's job is to support that, but one of the main job, especially on a low budget set, is slating for the second AC and taking notes. Really good first ACs will take notes for you too, especially if you don't have a lot of people, but some of them can't do the two things. So the second AC has to help you take note. And it's like note and slating. So I'll talk about slating a little bit later, uh, tips and tricks on how to do it. Uh, is there another thing, Dua? What's like the, uh, where does like the grip department and bus boy and all those fall under the AC? Uh, so the, under the DP department, you have uh, three more departments. So you have the DP, and then you have your camera department, your grip department, your electric department. So uh, under the camera department, you will, well, I talked a little bit about this last time, but I'll go over again. The camera department will have your camera operator, if you can afford it, or if the DP likes that. Your first AC, second AC. And uh, in the film business, you have a loader. Uh, but now we have a DIT, but DIT can fall under the post or the camera department. It just kind of depends on the, uh, on the production. Right now it's still kind of a gray area because really good DITs will actually color your film on set for you. Mm -hmm. So you have to look up uh, what you want, roughly as, at least, and they will calibrate your monitors for you. But some sets, your ACs will not calibrate your monitor for you. So it's kind of like a gray area, but that's kind of, how it is. And then for the electric <laughs> gaffer or the lighting technician is the main title for it. And you have your best boy uh, electric and then you have your electricians. On um, bigger sets you have juicers and you have lamp operators. So usually, oh and then you have your Jenny operators too. So it's gaffer, best boy, Jenny operator, uh, lamp operator, juicers. So it, they kind of explain how they are, but the the gaffer, how I like to put it is that the gaffer is the DP's right hand man, and the key grip is the DP's left hand man. So in the gaffer, the like is the gaffer's right hand man. There's really no left hand for that bit. Yeah, so uh, with the best boy, the electric or grip, what well, usually what I do is I take care of the equipment. I take care of the time card for the electric team if you're a Best Buy electrician. Mm -hmm. uh, but I still, on top, on top of taking care of that inventory, I'm still the gaffer's right hand man. So there, I might be doing that and I might be setting up a big light for him. So the Best Boy is, has a lot of duties under. And usually really good gaffers almost never leave the side of the DP unless they absolutely have to. 
Because usually when I work, when I used to work as a best boy, the gaffer would be next to the DP and I would be in the truck and he would say, hey, we're doing this setup. Or sometimes he'll leave his mic on and I will hear them talk. So by the time they figure out what they want, I already got all the equipment ready for them, even if I don't know where it's going. So I take it to set and he can say, hey, this goes in there. And then the juicers, if uh, at the Jenny uh, operator, if you're on a set with a generator, that's all they do. They just make sure your generator works. They plug in your big cables. I'll go through that later too. And just make sure the generator doesn't get catch on fire. Uh, and then that goes down to the juicer who usually they'll run cables to make sure everything's clean. Uh, they might not even touch any light as an electrician. And then you have your lamp, lamp operators who only operates the light. But it's interchangeable because what I'm talking about right now is usually like big set, like big Hollywood, thirty hundred million dollar set. So when on a smaller set, you you just have electrician. There's nothing below it. So as a best boy, I will run the generator. I will run cables. So on smaller sets like that. And then the key grip again is the uh, DP's left hand man. But he's also responsible for safety on set. So the safety on set, the main safety on set of the person is responsible. Okay, let me go back. The AD, the assistant director, is responsible for safety on set, main safety on set. If anybody dies on set or gets hurt, it's usually the, the first AD's fault. But uh, with that said, the key grip is also responsible, responsible for that. So let's say if you're rigging something on a ceiling, it's the key grip's job to make sure that that thing's not gonna fall and hit anybody. If you're rigging a car, it's his job to make sure that nothing flies off and hits another person. But the AD will come and check, say, hey, is this safe? And they will work uh, in communicado with that. But with that, the, yeah, the gaffer will put it, I mean, the key grip is, uh, will, shape the light for you. One of the term I learned is that the electricians will uh, turn the light on for you and the, the grips will shape the light for you. So that's really the best way to put it. So let's just say in my situation right now, I'm lit, but I don't want the background to be as bright. So that's the grips job to uh, do whatever they can to, to do that. So they handle flags, the uh, C stands, um, combo stands, if you rig a condor, that's their job. I mean, there's a lot of interchangeable things that people do, but once you start working more on it, you will know, like, oh, this is what I do, this is what you do. And on smaller sets, most of the time, you'll probably be grip electric screen, so you do two things at once. And it's okay because, I mean, you're not in a union, so it's not a big deal. So that's, that's the difference uh, between it. Uh, does that answer your question, Dua? Yeah, yeah. Just trying to, so people watch the real world be. Yeah. So usually on a smaller set, you you might only have a gaffer that is also your key grip, and one or two grip electric swing that does everything. So that's why I think a lot of people get confused because when you start on a smaller set, you're like, oh, I'm doing this as a gaffer, but you're really not supposed to be doing it. That's a grip's job, but that's where everything gets confused. So if you were like a, a like a uh, like inspiring filmmaker, what 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 like area do you you should start off with like to to kind of like get to know like the difference department? I think it really depends on where your end goal is. I think that's the one thing you have to think about because if you let's just say you just want to make movies and you're not sure, right? I say start out as a PA. Because when you start out as a PA, especially on a smaller set, they might put you in a position you haven't even heard of. For yeah. example, when I was in Minnesota, I PA for this short film, and all of a sudden, I was a script suit. I have no idea what I was doing. And all they told me was, take note, ask the, ask the people by the camera what the lens is. So they gave me like a sheet, and I just fill out the sheet. And what the shot is. And that's what I did. And like, even at the end of that 
Sir, I have no idea what a script is. I thought it was somebody who like was supposed to read the script, make sure it makes sense. So that's not what it is. So, and some some people you might jump in, and they were like, "Oh, we need help with this flight." So help with this flight. So the producer needs you to contact to the actor or this. If they're not sure what you want to do in the intro, PA is a good start. But if you say, hey, I want to be a DP or I just want to crib, then that's the department. Or like, if you want to be a director, unfortunately, there's a job on set that you could uh, really get in and learn directing. The only one is probably PA because you might see the director, you might end up assistant the director. The best way is to find a director that you like or somebody in town and just say, hey, can I shadow you? And yeah. just shadow them. That's really the best way. But as a producer, yeah, definitely start out with a PA. That, usually, that would usually lead you more to a producer. Being a producer, there's different, there's probably like two types of producer. One is creative and one is like, yeah. Yeah, so there's this producer who well, actually worked with a writer before uh, the movie even gets greenlit, and they'll do that, or they will get a uh, script that they like, and then they'll work with the writer and say, hey, this, uh, this is the way your story's going. I kind of want to do this do that. So those are the creative producers. But there are producers who just comes in, find the crews, put everybody together, and just make the movie happen, find distributors. And you have line producer, you have unit production manager, that's also with the producers. Uh, yeah, it goes back to the, to the PAs who are part of the producing team. But then we do have like camera PAs, and stuff like that too. So you could specifically, if it's on a bigger set, you have a bigger PA or post production PA. So uh, there's there really isn't a direct path. I guess that's kind of what I'm saying is like, because this industry, you might think that, oh, I want to do this, but you get it, you might not like it, you might figure out, oh, I actually like doing this a little bit more. It's, I guess I'll just tell you the reason why I want to be a DP is because I feel like the DP is one of the person that never sits down on set. Yeah, I guess my girlfriend tells me I'm a busy body person. So I have to always do stuff. Because, for example, the, the, as a director, you might, if you trust your crew and your actors, your job is pretty much done with, when you get to set or even before that. Because when the director makes short, I call my actor and I say, hey, this is the character that, I'm, that I think, I'm thinking your character is. Like, tell me your thoughts on it, like these moments. So we, we go, because it's a short film, it's a little easy, but we go through the whole script. We talk about beats. And when I'm on set, I kind of just let the, them run. And if I see something that I'm like, oh, you know, let's just adjust this. So going back to that, if you have a crew that you trust, you already talk about most of that with your actor, you block it, and then the DP already know what they're doing. So you, most of the time, you might just go and sit for a minute, talk to the wardrobe, that's it. But as a DP, I have to make sure that the lighting is correct. If we have a dolly shot, the dolly's going the correct way, the wardrobe, uh, the color of my well, role will not work with the wardrobe or maybe even talk with a sound guy. Hey, this is the shot. So you, you need to think about it. So usually when I DP, I'm almost always never not doing anything throughout the day. And that's personally, that's what I like. But some people don't like that. They don't know, hey, just do this and that. And when I do it, like, I love it too because when I did the reality show, we just rigged a room and we go and sat in a truck for four hours while they film that because in reality, you're not really doing a whole lot of creative stuff. So, yeah, it really comes down to what? Are you peeing this guy? No, I'm getting a cup of water. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go to the bathroom. I mean, it sounds like you're peeing, like looking at Oh, see, I'm getting a glass of water. <laughs> oh uh, gosh. Uh, any more questions, Tua? No, 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 that's good. Okay. So I want to talk about Quentin Cable just because this is one of the areas where a lot of people think they know what they're doing, 
but it's not directly correct, or it might be different. So I just want to talk. Can you see, guys? Can you guys see my cursor? Uh, okay, I, I'm hoping you see my cursor. So I want to talk about the different cables first. So uh, let's talk about the electrical cables. Electrical cables are pretty much any cables that can give you power. So this one on the left here, top left, is a Bates cable. So these, the two on the top, if you're not working with generators or you're on a stage with a power box, you almost will never see, especially on super low indie set. So this is a Bates cable. This goes from your either your lunchbox. Oh, I should have that. I'll show you that later. Your lunchbox, or if you're on a stage that has Bates out, it will always have three pins, two close to each other, and one a little to the side. Three holes for the, the male side will look like this, female side. So the Bates cable will have uh, 100 amp and 60 amp. So if you're 100 amp, it's just bigger. These the insert are just bigger. And the 60 amp is just smaller. And it'll say on the thing is 60 amp, 60 AMP or 100 AMP. So if you're not sure, just look, it'll say on it, on, on this thing. And then these are cam locks. So cam locks will go to a generator or a stage that has really big, uh, really big power out output for you. Uh, cam locks, let me see if I remember correctly, green is ground. Uh, and then these others are just your power output. So the thing with cam lock is you have to make sure that you always plug in your green first. Usually people will not let you do this unless they absolutely know you're, you know what you're doing, unless they're just lazy and don't care. So it, it looks like there's just holes, but inside the holes, the male will have pins inside the holes like this too. So when you look at it, you see it. So usually what will happen if Let's say you're on a production that has a big generator. Your Jenny operator will uh, plug the cam lock into the correct things, and it'll come out to a what we call a distro box, a distribution box, and the distribution box will have outlets for the Bates cable. And then you go from the Bates cable into another box that's called a lunch box, and then that's where you have your regular household outlets. But there are lights, there are some lights. If I remember correctly, there is no light that takes cam lock, but there are a lot of lights that take uh, base. Turbo because if you're working on like a 18,000 watt, you can't just plug a regular house into. So that's where you use this. Uh, and then you have your data cable. So your data cable is, could be like your HDMI, your SDI, your sound cable. Anything that doesn't necessarily transmit power, I know some HDMI transmit power, but they're not power cables. Then on like a bigger set, you will almost never see an HDMI cable. So but on indie set, you'll definitely see HDMI cable. So I just want to talk a little bit. If you guys, I don't have real stingers, I just because I use a lot of LED and I shoot stuff that hire me that requires me to have cables are not worth me investing in like real extension cables. So you can use these. Uh, the one thing I would uh, suggest if you buy these is to look, make sure it's three prong so that you, you are safe even if you're using LEDs. And if you look at, uh, usually it's on a label when you buy that, it'll say I think like 14-0, 12-0 or 16-0. Uh, I would suggest you get 14 0 instead of 16, just because it's bigger, it's more sturdy, more powerful. It's like if you're just using LED, it's not going to really matter if you're using 16. But do you, you do you have to, do you have if if this is your uh, field? Do you have to like like get your own stuff or feel like the? Like uh, that's a that's a yes and no question. Yeah. Like, there are some people that never own like any of this. Just because they start out, they hooked up with a director that made a movie that's good, and then everything they do from them, they just rent. So they never have to own this. So the reason I own this is because I shoot a lot of low budget stuff, and I shoot a lot of documentary. So this is why I own this. But you don't have to own this. Even as a DP, you don't even have to own a camera. 
Yeah. So, and I will say that if you want to be a director, especially nowadays, I know a lot of directors want to buy cameras, but it's not, it's really not um, worth it. I guess that's the word. Because a lot of people own cameras now, especially if you want to buy a website that has, that you could rent stuff for like cheap. Yeah, that too. You can rent stuff off people for cheap. And like I would say like 90% of the people that want to be DPs now, especially those coming up, they will have a camera. And a lot of them, especially if they don't have a lot of credit, they will use their camera for free for you. So if you just want to be a DP or, oh, sorry, no, I didn't see it. If you just want to DP, be a DP, oh, not DP, a director or a producer, I personally, I don't think you have to invest in a camera. I would rather save that money that you're going to invest in a camera and invest in your actual project. But I own a black magic that's, I think it's like 1200 Like, just think about it, that $1,200 could be part of your budget for your movie. Mm. And if you hire somebody who, like, just came out of film school, they might not even charge you to shoot your movie. So that 1200 could go towards equipment, food, even, oh, hey, Mom, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, unmute. Okay, you're unmute. Right. Sorry, Kat. I think you unmute me, so I, I couldn't uh, remute me. Anyways, uh, just to add to that, I think that uh, it's really good to have your own uh, if you're in that field, simply because, you know, you always want to continuously learn and adapt. So, like, if you're a DP, right, or, like, if you're a cinematographer but you don't have a camera, it's really hard to, you know, practice your craft without a camera. You know, I mean, you can use your phone and everything, but it's always better to have what you need, you know? Like even with cabling, I think it's good to have cabling so that you know how to just roll out the cable. You know what I mean? Yeah, but the, the thing to think about with that is cameras change so fast now that yeah, like my camera is already in a way obsolete, and I bought it last year. Right. So, like, it really, it's a good and bad thing, but it's, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is you can't have it if you can afford it, but if you want to be like a director or producer, I really don't think you should get it just because there's so many DPs that own equipment. Oh, Mom, you're muted again. Okay. Yeah, so if the same with like uh, like sound equipment. I know like some people or some producers buy sound equipment. Just sometimes it's expensive to rent sound equipment or hire a sound guy. But the thing with sound is, yeah, I know, like I tell producers all the time, I know what clipping sounds like. And I know what when you get sound, but I'm not going to know as well as a sound guy who's like, Oh, this isn't clipping, but it doesn't sound good. Like to me, oh, I hear it sounds good. So it's that's why sometimes you it's good to buy stuff, but it's not necessary. So let me go through the coiling cable. So the, what we learn in film school is we always learn over under, but in I guess in Hollywood, uh, you don't. <clears throat> that's not true for all cables. So. Electrical cables is, uh, what I learned is it's clockwise and uh, basketball size. So what I mean by that is you take your cable and left or right handed, it just goes clockwise. And if the cable has been correctly coiled before, it should just go into the loop on its own. And it should just go like that. And the reason why we do uh, the reason why we do uh, basketball size is because uh, so let me show you another reason why we do this for electrical cables. Let me see if you can see the ground. Uh -huh. So on an electrical cable, I like to plug it in, or actually, no, it's opposite. So let's just say this is my light over here. So I would set my cable down the female out by the light, right? And you're supposed to be able to take one end and just lock it without any loop happening. 
see, mm. it's on call on its own like that. And you plug it in, and then what you do is, once you're done with that, this side, you flip it over so that uh, you can see the female. The reason for that is because when you plug it in, can you guys see this? I hope you can see this. Can come closer? Uh, okay. So when you, when you plug in your light, uh, if you have to raise your light, the cable should just go on the phone like that. That's hmm. reason. So if you don't do if you don't do that, uh, I think over under does do that, but this is just the way the industry does it down here. So the other thing I want to point out is that this is how the union people do it. And if you want to be an electrician, you have to do this. But if you're working at a video production company and they always do over under, just go with them. It's it's wrong for the union, but it's not wrong for the company, so go with your company. So that's another thing. This is a trick that people don't uh, don't uh, don't really see that they think they know. And another thing is sometimes you're in a hurry and you're like, oh, I can't do this. Oh, okay, plug it in. Okay, that's very ugly. Like I, as a DP, as an electrician, I hate this. I don't like this. I always try to, even if this happens, I always come in and try to fix it. Like I just do that even before I plug it right in. Over under. Bam, that's done. It's not very hard. And then you can do that. Uh, and like, uh, since you can see here. So another thing is uh, that, or a trick to this cabling is I don't like, a lot of people don't like seeing cable. So if you're running across this room, that's bad. I know you can tape it. You can tape it down, but usually what we teach people is it's some people call it wireless, you know, wireless power. You're not like really good best boys and really good electricians. You would never or almost never see the sting or this the extension cord. They will either go like this over here, but also if you don't have the budget to get the wrong cable, you're always not going to be able to do it. But always find a way, and they always talk about 90 degree, like go to the wall 90 degree, so people, people don't have an opportunity to trip on it. Obviously, you're going to run to situations where you have to go across the door, so you're going to see the cable, but as much as you can, if you're an electrician, make sure people never see cable, your cable, and it's never like squiggly, whatever. That's, that's a big deal. That's another, that's a, Big plus for you to get another job. So if you, ooh, if you learn the clockwise, if you learn the cabling correctly, uh, that you're, I guarantee you, if you're not an asshole, you're gonna get a lot of jobs afterwards. That's if you want to be an electrician. And then, I mean, is there is there is there a reason why uh, you have to like wrap it that way or? Yeah, just because of the way the tensioning of the cable is. And I think the industry started with that, so they just uh, like that. And like I said, sometimes, actually, let me show you this. My room is kind of short. But sometimes you're in a hurry and you need your cable to go there, so you're supposed to be able to throw it. And it kind of looks like that. So that's what helps you. Never, ever do this. This is where you're going to lose your cable. It's really bad. It's like they post their wire and yeah. So see, even, even if it's like this, people that have been in the industry for a long time, they could do this really fast. And you see how it's coming into its own loop? I almost don't have to do anything. I just, I just have to make sure it's straight. So. And usually, like, there are times when you get it really well, and these two will plug in its own when you get to here, but I'm not, I'm not that good. So it's okay, do this. So now I will tell you the reason why we do a basketball size is because we put our cables in no creeks. So the basketball size is made for the no creek. And the way you, this is another thing that, 
may sound not important, but it's actually really important. When you put your cables away, don't set your milk plate like this. Set it like this, and then you literally just put it in the back. And it makes it easier for you to store your cables. I have a lot of weird cables, so you do that, and when you're done, you can flip it. Like, if a person that's experienced on set sees you do this, they will know you know what you're doing. And again, this is another plus for future. Have you ever electrocuted your dog? Not yet. <laughs> Hey guys, I have to go walk my dog, so I'll, I'll see you guys later. Thanks, Kat. Yeah, let me know. I might do another one on acting, so do I, maybe I'll get you in. You can talk more about working on set as an actor. Cool. All right, thank you. Bye, Dua. Bye. Right, so now, obviously, since I talked about that, this is an XLR cable. An XLR is what we learn in school, the over-under. So I think a lot of people should know that already. Obviously, I don't know the loop size because I'm not an audio guy. But you, and this, if you don't get this right away, don't feel bad. It took me, I think, over five years to get this. So don't feel bad. So you go over and you take this and you go under. This is really easy, but it's really hard. So. Don't feel bad if you don't get it right away. Like it took me a long time to get this. But even now I'm still not good. So this is for SDI cable, uh, XLR cable. Some HDMI's you can't do this because they're very stiff. So it's just however the HDMI came in. But yeah. In this one, you should be able to pull it also like the other one. There's no problem, but I think you can't throw it from the rest of the If you if you throw it like wraps itself. Now, these are just basic technique. I know this is the one we learn in school. So when we go on to set, we tend to always do this. But it's if you want to be like an electrician or whatever, that's not the correct way for uh, for electrical cables. Uh, do you guys have any questions on that subject? Okay. All right, so now moving on. C stands. So the reason I pick this photo is because I want to emphasize the fact that C stands are not light stands. People don't understand that, and I've been on so many sets where they put lights on C stands. Yeah, if you have to arm it out like this, you can you can use it as a light stand. But C stands are not light stands. That's one thing to uh, to remember. And uh, it's kind of backward. I think they Photoshop this. is really weird. But this one is really backward. So you see that? So I'll show you my. Oh, and. The two standard seats thing are the 40 inch and the 20 inch. But if somebody, if you're on set and somebody said, give me your Gary Coleman, they're not joking with you. They're asking for the short 20 inch C stand. So I have my C stand over here. Mm -hmm. And then I have. So this is not a true 20 inch. I think this is a 24 inch. I bought this for my monitor. So C stand have many different types, but the two standard type are spring loaded and non spring loaded. Come on, buddy. Oh, fine. So the spring loaded uh, is just like this. It's just all spring. There's nothing. There's this lock with this lock. This is a turtle basement. I'll talk about that in a little bit. So the and then I'll show you the non-spring loaded. So non-spring loaded is like this. There's no spring, it's like very loose. So there are very many different schools on how to open and close the C-stand. So I will tell you my way of opening and closing. This is a, I think it's full American, yeah, okay, so this is full American grip. Uh, 
you will most likely never see an American uh, standard C stand on set just because they're very expensive when you're starting out. But once you get into like bigger, bigger projects, you will only see American standard with this, like this particular one, because this is you know, for the industry, the best C stand out there. So uh, learning about this is good when you get into bigger sets. But a lot of people will teach you different ways on how to open this leg, but this is how I do it. If you have a good C-stand that doesn't have any problem, you literally, like, this is how I do on set. People always get impressed. I just do that, and mine's old so it doesn't snap. Right, it should snap. There you go. Snap into itself. And then you just lock it. But if you don't, if you can't do that, literally, when you unlock it, you just push it. And then go into itself. Like the good seat stand that's not old like mine, mine is like super old, I bought it used. Then you just block it like that. You don't have to do anything special to it. And then closing the seat stand, you already see me kind of do it, but uh, what we do is you unlock it. Then I, I lift this a little bit. I go towards this. So this is the tallest one, if you look. Tallest, middle. So you start with the tallest. I just lift it. I don't know, it's just over the over the group and then I come to I come to the next one, next tallest one. I lift that one and it should snap on its own like that. And just lock it. So because I know in film school I remember they teach us and they like turn it upside down. You do this. And I will tell you a funny story. When I first moved to LA, I was a PA on a music video and the Key grip, who's worked on a lot of movies, he asked me to go grab a C stand. So I went and I grabbed it. I can't remember if it was already set up, but I grabbed it and I think I turned it. And he's like, that's how I know you don't have to be experienced. And it's very true because, like nowadays, when I use a C stand, I just do this. Something I don't even know. That's it. Where I just do that and I just go and I just lock it on my way to set. So it's like you don't have to flip it or, or anything like that. And this one, since I'm working on this one, this one has a rocky mountain. So the rocky mountain is this side. Just to, just so that I think you already know where rocky mountain is, but just giving you an example. There's my chip. There's my stool. It's a little high. If you're on a stair or whatever, rocky mountain. Bam! You have a and that's uh, any standards like that. You might be in situations where you have to absolutely do this, and you can, but make sure you bag the kit out of this. But you should never ever use it like this if you can help it. That's why they create rocky mount. That's why, like, see this this guy doesn't have a rocky mount. That's why, like, 99% of the time, if you're on a bigger set, you will never see this C stand. There's a copy Chinese one I bought from a monitor. And yeah, so you can lock it, you can make sure it's straight. I usually just, you should be always eyeball it. So, yeah. and then, yeah. I know on film school you also learn this, but I just, I cannot emphasize this enough. So, the trick to this is. The trick to using, so when you store DC stands, you turn this head this way so that when you flip it upside down or you put it in the cart, it doesn't jam out. So this is the only way you store it. But you never use a C stand like this. If you look at this, uh, my C stand is actually not calibrated correctly. So if you look, if a C stand is, uh, has been fixed and serviced well, you will see these three small knobs on the side. And if you look down, I'll raise this up. The leg is facing the tall, the tall leg is facing that way. So let's say if I'm looking right, the three knots on the side, the tall leg, I should see the tall leg over there. So the, uh, always, always use a stand like this. And what I learned from another local 80 guy, what he said is that. You should, uh, 
use the arm as little as you can and you should not ever have to do this a whole lot. Uh, I mean, the C-stand is made so you can do this, but I found that like, union guys who are really good at not having to do this, like just by placing your C-stand. But the reason why, oh, so uh, just keep this in mind, the three small knobs on your left, the two big knobs on your right, that's the best way to remember it. And they're always, like the hiding thing is always to your right, always to your left. So if you ever have to use a C-stand, just remember that. And the reason for this is because it tightens this way. So if you put something heavy here, it'll just go and keep tightening. But if you, if you look at the photo, it's opposite. So the photo, the stand is like this. So if I put something heavy here, and the heaviness goes, it's like, bam. It just keeps going. So that's why that that's actually from a store. It's really sad. So uh, same with this knot. It tightens this way also. So if you do the other way, it it'll come down. I know this has been taught a lot, and you probably hear this a lot. But when you get upset, things are happening. You forget, or you think you're doing it right. You're not. I've seen it many many times. So just remember. Usually what I like to do is I put the <clears throat> like I put the C stand down and I usually just do this and I look. So you got two big ones and two small ones here. Make sure the big one is sticking out over there. And the C stand is made so you can stand on it. So I'm, I do this all the time. They're very heavy duty. So the next set of C-stand is the spring loaded. So I'll show you guys how to do a spring loaded also. So spring loaded, same thing. In film school, they'll teach you flip it upside down because it is pretty easy to do this. I'm not even doing it right because I haven't done this in a long time. I hate this technique. So they'll teach you to do that. But the way I learned, the way I've been doing it, that personally, I think it's faster is I take it, but this one you have to be careful, look behind you because there might be people behind you. I put it on my shoulder and I just open it. Start from the smallest one, open one, it'll snap into the thing, open two, bam, that's it. So you put the seat down on your shoulder with the legs facing down, take the small one, the farthest one from you, the farthest one for you is flip it to the counterclockwise to your right. It'll snap into place. You take the next one, same thing. Yeah. So that's it. And then putting this away, that's another thing people will put it upside down. But if you sorry, I got to tilt the stuff. But the best way to put to put this away is if you look at all the <coughs> the legs, right? The tallest one. You take the tallest one. You take the tallest leg. You put it next to your thigh. Doesn't matter how you are. Put it next to your thigh, and you just start pulling. That's it. You never have to flip the C stand. Do it again. So let's say your C stand on the ground. Doesn't matter how it is. You pick it up. You find the tallest leg. You put it next to your thigh. You just start pulling the one. Love it, toward it, and that's it. You will run into crappy C stands where it's like, oh, it's hard to climb, but that's not your fault. It's just the C stands old and they don't know how to take care of it. Ed, do you always go counterclockwise opening C stands? Yeah, so that's the okay. way. And I, or it might just be because I'm right-handed too. I've never done it because this goes really far. Okay. Yeah. So I always just yeah. Yeah. So this guy has a turtle base. So that's where this knob is for. And these you see a lot on like photos and smaller shoe because it's actually easier to transport like this. So these are made like this. So if somebody asks for a turtle base, that's what this is. This is a turtle base. Turtle base is just the base of the C stamp. 
then you can still open it the same way. So a lot of people will put lights on there, they put an adapter, the light, or slider, or whatever. So that, that's the turtle base. Uh, removable, okay. Yeah, so the small ones, they, they do have a 24, uh, size 24 too, but it's standardly uh, just the 40 and the 20. Uh, I was debating if I wanted to talk about this, but I think I'm going to, since it's useful. There's a thing when you use a system they call underslate. So I just have to check and see if anybody else shows up. That they call underslaying. Where underslaying means you take your arm and you put it down. So you underslaying it like that. And this is because when you're inside, see my floppy over here? It's really big. So you can't put the floppy on top here because it will hit the, hit the scene. So you you understand like this, you put your floppy in and you can use it and you can adjust it. But the problem is a lot of us learn this technique because we're always working in small spaces. So we're always underslinging. But when you get outside, you don't underslang anymore because there's no high ceiling to block your flag or whatever. So if you're putting a floppy on, you can keep it like this and just put it on outside. You don't, the underslang is only for indoor when you where you don't have the space. But again, if you're on a bigger set where people already know what they're doing, they will request smaller stands, like Gary Coleman. So you don't have to understand anymore either because if you have a Gary Coleman that's very short, you put your flag on, it's not gonna hit the ceiling. So you don't have to understand the, the small C stand also. Uh, any questions on C stands? Uh, so now we go down to slating. All right, slating is another thing that we get confused sometimes when we're on set. So if you look at this photo here with the hand, that is an insert slate. Insert slates are like really small. Some are like that big. Some are like literally that big. It's literally for inserts. So that's why they're called insert slate. And the reason why insert slate doesn't have a clapper is because 100% of the time you do an insert, you're not doing audio, where there's no audio. So that's why there's no clapper. So you almost never uh, sync it. But uh, I guess I shouldn't say 100%. There might be times, special situations where you might need, need to sync. Uh, and then you have your smart slate, which is this one. Uh, it's called smart slate because it's got the time code on it. This is time code. So this time code will jam, what they call it jam. It'll sync with your camera. So the camera with, with the camera and the audio recorder. So the <clears throat> code of the camera, the slate, and the audio recorder are all exactly the same. They might vary sometimes like a couple frames, but the idea is that they're supposed to be exactly the same. So when you sync later, it's, you could just take the time code. Because I'm sure if you sync all, but before there might be an option that says sync with time code. So the problem with this is if you don't know what you're, using, what you're doing, it might go off like a couple of frames, you might not be able to tell it. So usually when people do a smart slate, they will sync it during the day and then they will, or they will jam it in the morning and they'll jam it again after lunch, just to make sure that. Jamming just means syncing the, everything together. Uh, so let me bring out my slate and show you guys slate. Here. So this is my slate. Uh, when you slate, uh, usually in the beginning of the day, or if you do a new scene, a lot of people like to say the title of the movie. So let's just say we're first shot of the day and we're making yeah, what do you I just put this up? This feature I'm shooting right now. And I'm sure you've seen these markers. It's got a removable eraser in the back. So you just say, you never say the role. Ooh. 
one, Apple, take one. So the goal of the slate is before, the slate should be the first frame you see on camera. It doesn't matter if it's MOS or sync. Uh, that's the one problem that people don't understand nowadays is that they will roll the camera and you nothing and then the slate comes in. Or the slate will come in like this and it's confusing like, wait, is that a sync shot or is that an MOS? So if you're doing a sync shot, when the slate comes into frame, it should always come in open like this. And this should be the first frame you see on every shot whether it's sync or whether it's MOS. So uh, a really good second eight scene where it should be that big in the frame. Like putting up everything in the frame should just be the slate. Sometimes you have to be small if you have to, but try to get it as close to the full frame as you can. And they'll teach you like this lens should be this far, this lens should be that far. Uh, so you be this close and usually they'll say, uh, this one is fair for spare for, for one apple take one. So the the letters you always say phonetically. You could say Apple, Amanda, America, but it has to be sound out. Don't say one A. Because it's just uh, take for example one B. One B depending on your accent might sound like one P or even one T. So that's why they you have to phonetically sound it seriously. Like one Bravo, one Baker, one Bob, anything. Uh, so everything has to be phonetically sound out. Uh, and then before you clap it, they like to hear you say Mark. So you say Mark, and you clap it. And a lot of people are in the hearse, so they're like, like that. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I thought somebody said something. So I don't care if you're in a hurry, don't do this. Because they need to see the clap, then you can move up. Because a lot of the time, like stupid people, especially inexperienced people, will be like, hurry with the slate. And you're like, damn, like, you can't even see where the, your mark is. So make sure you I usually do mark, and then that, give it like one second at least, so they can see it. Uh, and then on a MLS, this is the way I taught this is the way I like, because this for sure, if they see this, it's for sure an MOS shot. Because if some people teach this, but some people like to slay and do that. So it's like, oh, is that a MOS or did they miss the clap or whatever? So this for sure, if somebody sees this, it's for sure MOS. And obviously you have to sync an MOS here, but a lot of the time people will forget this because you're just moving so fast, so they forget to move it to MOS down here. Because sometimes people don't read this, so yeah, for sure, MOS like this. You can do this too, but again, this could get confusing. The for sure way is that. And when you do MOS, you don't have to say anything. You just hear camera roll, and then you're done. You don't, you don't have to, you don't have to call anything else because there's no audio, so whatever you say, nobody's gonna hear. But try not to cover the title. It doesn't really matter. Uh, if you're an operator, some, well, sometimes you'd be so tight that your slave's like this, and the DP or the operator might say, hey, can you run the slave? So what they mean is, uh, when they mean run the slave, is you're supposed to do this, so they can see the clap. So running so that they can breathe that, oh, it's seeing one apple, take one. That's the title, and then mark like that. So that's what they mean when they say run the slate. Because sometimes they're like, sometimes like you'd be like this, and if you can see the monitor, the operator will try to catch you, and you're trying to catch the monitor. So it's easier for them to just say, hey, run the slate. Usually they can start like, I like to start like this so they know, and slowly come down. And if it's a really smart uh, AD, they will. Say roll camera and you'll run the slate and there will sound and that's when you can you can clap. And obviously you've heard a soft stick. Soft stick is when you're really close to your actor and you just slightly tap it so you don't scare your actor. Because usually when you slay you
type it as loud as you can so the sound can hear. But the, you say soft stick for two things. The first thing is for the actor to know that you're not slapping the slate. And the second thing is for sound to know that you're not slapping the slate. So if they have to turn up the recorders just for that moment, they can. Or if they want me to bring their boom right next to it, they can. Usually, if you're on a set where people have been working for a while, they will know if you, they see the slate right next to an actor's face, sound will know. They will have to. Uh, but you still have to do it as courtesy for everyone. So you say, say one apple, take one, soft stick, like that. So, and some actors, like, they were very particular. They were yelling. you. Like, the funny ones will yell at you as a joke, but the non-funny ones will get on your shit, and you could potentially get fired. So that's why we do soft stick. Uh, and then if you have to do, uh, let me go to multiple camera. So when you do multiple cameras, let's just pretend I have a camera here and a camera over here and a camera over here. So there's two ways of slating multiple camera. One way is if all the camera can see the slate. So if, it, if all the camera can see the slate, then it's called a common mark. So you just put the photo up, you say, when it's fair to fair, scene one, take one, common mark, and then you're done. But if not all the camera can see the slate, then you have to slate it for the camera. So let's just say A, B, C. So you say, uh, you don't have to say it. You don't have to slate it every time you're at the camera. Slating just means you're saying the scene number in the tape. So if somebody, like if you put the slate up and they say, hey, slate it, that doesn't mean you clap it. That means you have to say scene one, Apple, take one. So you would say, let's just say we're doing three cameras. We say roll camera, camera's only roll sound, sound speed. So I say C1 Apple, take one A mark, and I go over here, B mark, I go over here, C mark, and then that's it. So you don't do one Apple, take one A mark, one Apple, take one B mark, one Apple, take one C mark. You don't have to say that for all three cameras because audio already heard it the first time. The uh, same thing with second stick. If you, let's just say, if I did it by accident, I did, then I, oh, I didn't see this. The slate, can you do, give me a second stick. So when you do a second stick, you don't have to, again, uh, let me just go from the beginning. So let's just say I do one apple, take one, uh, mark. And I'm like, oh, your slate, I can't see it. Give me a second stick. So I just go, second stick. That's it. I don't have to say one apple, take one again before I mark it. Well, and I don't have to say mark again. Well, you could say mark if you have to say it. Just say second stick, mark, like that. So same thing with third stick, fourth stick. Sometimes you'll get to that because somebody messed up somewhere. But yeah, you don't have to re-say the whole thing when you do that. Uh, we talk about tail stick, talk about slating. Uh, tail stick, uh, there's two schools of tail stick, tail stick. One school is you come in. So what tail stick is, is if you can't slate at the beginning of the tape, so you have to slate at the end. Uh, so usually they'll say, uh, Roll camera, roll sound, this is one apple, take one, tail stick, so they don't see the slate at all. So we know it's tail stick. And the script will make a note that's tail stick also. So tail stick, you do the scene at the end, they're like, okay, cut, tail stick. So one screw of tail stick is you do upside down like that, you clap it, and you turn it so they can read it. Another screw is you do it this way, you clap it and you turn it. But the school that I learned I understand is this, because it's at the end, it's upside down, so you understand it's toasted. So usually if they don't, they don't slate it in the beginning, you have to slate it. I try to slate it at the end too, just in case. So I would say tail stick, say one apple, take one, tail stick, mark, like that. Sometimes they just do this and they don't even flip. That's something okay too, it depends on the set, but usually the way I learn is you tail stick, you turn so they can read. One apple, take one. Uh, so that's the proper way of slating. Uh, again, this should be the first frame you see on every shot. I've seen, I worked on a commercial before, some big commercial, and I was helping, I wasn't even working, I was just helping a guy do DIT work. And we saw a shot where they started the camera with the camera still in a camera cart, and it went on for like three minutes, carrying the camera around. And all of a sudden, I just like, I almost didn't convert that shot. We almost deleted that shot because this was the first thing we shot on 6K. 
and there's like the files were huge. So we're trying to save hard drive space. So I was just like, you know, I'll just scrap through it, see what's going on. Maybe there's some funny stuff. And good thing I saw those things because they would have not gone that shot because like you roll your camera for three minutes. I understand tape is cheap, but that's annoying and it's like, it's stupid. So always this should be the very first frame. If it's MOS, it's that. So that's just proper slating and B. Fill up the screen as much as you can with your slate. If you have to do this sometime, you have to. If you don't have to, that's the best. Uh, so yeah, do you guys have any question? What does the MOS stand for? Uh, it just means they're not recording sound. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, MOS just means they're not recording sound. And people will argue about what MOS stands for. I personally, I don't care. That's <laughs> <laughs> Like if you ask and you ask, there will be ten people explaining it to you. So it's just if they say this is an MOS shop, that's just what it means. They're not recording sound. Uh, but I do have a trivia question. Who owns the slate, especially a smart slate? The second AC. All right. I right, said so second AC. Anybody else has a guess? No, the sound guy owns the sleep, especially on a sleep. I just have a sleep because a lot of the sound people are starting out, they don't have sleep. And camera people do own sleep. <coughs> I should take that back. Uh, camera people do own sleep. We do have sleep, uh, especially when you get to bigger sample. Smart sleep, it's the sound guy that has the sleep. But the second AC preps the sleep. Yeah, I actually see uh, a lot of sound people. They own the slate, but they give it to ACs as well. Yeah, so usually they'll, at the beginning of the shoot, they'll give it to the AC, and it'll stay with camera until the shoot ends, unless something's wrong with the slate. So I want to Yeah, but yeah, camera people will always, like, we own, these are not smart slates, so we'll always own a smart slate and a answer slate. We always have that, but mainly it's the sound guy that has it. Uh, Question, Keck. Um, so then who jams the slate? Is it sound or is it the That's AC? The sound guy. He does it in, uh, he does it in co cooperation with the camera team. So usually it's him and the first AC that they, they do it. <laughs> usually they just hand the cord to the first AC, he just plays it in. Yeah. So, but it's the sound guy that does it. And usually he'll, he'll do it and he'll ask the first AC of the operator, like, read me your time code and they'll read it and they're like, okay, that's correct. Yeah. So I want to talk about equipment usage a little bit, especially light stand, because I already talked about C-stand and tripod because this is something that we also know, but it's not something that we really understand. So I don't have a real light stand, but I do have my combo stand. <laughs> kind of funny. It's for my HMI light. So in the industry, your stands will come like this. So I will show you. All right. So you see this metal thing in the middle. I'll stop right in the middle there. So it'll come, it'll open. 99% of the time, they should come like this, especially if you're first on set. So what you do is to operate the stand, what you do is you, uh, you see these two rocks. So there's a lot of rocks, but we, you'll see it better when you actually see in person. But there are these two locks here. This is a Rocky Mountain lock. So what you do is you loosen this two rock, and you pull in the middle bar, okay. I'm not sure if you can see this. The middle bar will come up. You pull it until it stops at the end, and then you lock the bottom. And then once you lock the bottom, you can open the leg and it will come down like that into a regular stamp. And the way to properly use this stand, if you look at the spreader, I'll just go back to that. If you look at the spreader, if you can, this flat. 
So it should never be like that or like that. It should always be flat if you can get it. This is the most stable for the stamp. That's why it has to be flat. But you're going to be in situations where you have to do this. And it's OK. Like, it's not ideal, but like nobody's going to kill you for it, especially if you have to do this. But just make sure it's flat if you can't. Like, especially like this or your outside, always flat. Uh, so this is just Rocky Mountain. It's kind of like the other Rocky Mountain on 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 even surface. You rock it to get it leveled. And then I'm going to show you the rise in the stand. This is another thing that we never think about, but this is very important. When you rise the stand, sometimes we don't think about it. We just start going up like that. But you should you should never do that. On a light stand or like a C stand, start with a top first. So you go on the top. I'm going to keep my scissors and you go down. And here's the reason why. If you don't start with the top, you start with the bottom, you go up, you're like, oh shit, I got to go higher. Oh, now I can't reach it. I got to come back down. And then sometimes you do this, and you're like, oh, I go up. And now I can go up more. Oh, I got to go up more. So it's like, this is why you have to go on the top first. And this is like small stuff that we don't really think about that really affects how we work. So just remember that on a light stand or anything like this, you use the very top first. And sometimes I'm scared to use the top because the top is smaller. So if you put something heavy on it, you do think it's not going to hold. But it's made to hold the equipment. So don't worry too much about it, especially if you're just going straight up. So always go with the top first. On a, or on a light stand or like a C stand. And again, this is like small thing that we don't think about that really affects how we work. And then when you put this away, let me talk to the camera down again. So the way to wrap this fan, uh, the, in the industry, I want to say 99% of the stand are like this. So when you wrap this fan, what you do is you unlock the top. So I pull it all the way up so that the leg close on its own. This is an old copy stand, so it's not very perfect. But, and then, and then now you can loosen the bottom one and you just pull down and it'll come down like that and you can block it. And then that's how you, that's how you store it. So if you um if you have a chance to be on a bigger set, you see these these little knob things. These are for you to hang, these only operate for you to hang the stand like and they will have cards that you can just put this right on there and just put the stand just hangs like that. So that's that's all they're for. Uh, let me show you a couple ways that people like to bag this. So I have a shop bag here. On these, especially these combo stamps, and people do like to hang the bag on this knot, and it's okay. But I don't like this because the bag is very heavy, and it could bend this. Uh, this knob here. So usually I'll put it and put it here. This is the other safest way on these spreaders. And if you guys can see it, then let me go back. On these spreaders, especially if you have a ball buster, because mine's not a ball buster, so it's, it's small. Uh, or usually it's hard to do it like this because it'll slide down, but sometimes it'll slide and stop here. So now that we're talking about that, try not to do your sandbag where it's touching the ground like that, because that is kind of yeah, see that? Camera. What? Right. Move, move up to a new location. Then press clean to restart. Whoa, who's that? So try not to do that same thing with a C-stand. That's what we always talk about. We put a sandbag and a C-stand, put it on the tallest leg. It. Touching the ground, it kind of doesn't. Touching the ground, it's not really doing a whole lot. Uh, it's not giving weight to it, so it's not doing a lot. That's why they always say put on the tallest leg first. Usually I'll do like two here, one here if I have to keep going. 
There may be two here, there may be one here, because by the time these stack up, this won't touch the ground anymore. Or like even three here. So that's how you properly stand up. And oh, there's different types of sandbag too. This one uh, is a shop bag. You have sandbag, you have ball busters, and you have shop bags. Those are the three common ones. So shop bags are smaller ones like this. They're usually half the size or three quarter of the size of a regular sandbag, but they are heavy. They're either heavier or the same weight, but smaller. So this one's actually 35 pounds, it's really small. And they're called shop bags because they put like metal pellets in here. That's why they get higher with it. And the sandbag obviously have, obviously have sand in it. And ball busters are like the big ones. Uh, it's like, so ball busters are usually 35 pounds, which is the same weight as this. But ball busters are usually better for these fans, so that's why they make them for these for outside and stuff like that. So those are the three types of sandbags. So right. Uh, what do you want? Oh, so, apple box. Uh, I put the apple box picture here. So, if you get a full apple box like this, it's called apple family. So, apple family consists of the full apple box, half, quarter, and pancake. So, those are their names. Full, half, quarter, and pancake. The pancake sometimes is called an eighth, but usually we don't call it eighth. We just say pancake. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about using the apple box. So apple box, there's three ways of setting it. So one way is like this, one is like that, and then one is like that. So the names for these are the flattest, lowest one. This is LA, because LA is east to west, so you're getting the idea already. But this is LA. If you go to the second tallest, this is Chicago. And if you go to the highest, this is New York. So sometimes people will say, hey, bring me a apple box. And I'm like, uh, give me, put that in LA. Do that. So that's what they need. And like they say, Chicago. Like that. So that's what they mean. So LA is the flattest one. Chicago is the second tallest one, the middle height, and New York is the tallest one. So usually you only do this on like a full and a half, almost never a quarter, because quarter won't really hold this. Just depending on your situation. Uh, and then tripod. I have two tripods because I have to show you how to. See. So using the tripod is opposite from using the light stand when you raise it. When you raise the tripod, you start from the lowest and you go up from the lowest and then you go from here. And it's the same thing with when why you use the other one, why you use the light stand the same way, the other way because so if I, let's say, and this is very common, I still make this mistake, because you're in a hurry, you start with this, and you lock it, and you're like, oh, I gotta go higher. Oh, crap, now I gotta go way over here. Now the camera's on it, it's heavier, it's it's hard to balance, so you gotta go with this, so from the bottom, so that's why you start with the bottom, and you go up. And I have two tripods. That one is a different. This is my go to one that is a little different. This one only has one lock. So that's why I didn't, I didn't show you this one with that. And the one lock. So this one, the one lock can go however. So that's why it's a bad, bad example, this one. But this one, I do want to show you how to. Properly store the head. So, if you're on a set, so if you look, oh, there is. So if you look, there's numbers here. These are the tensioning 
uh, tripod. So this one is the pan. So if you see, see how it, it's on zero right now, you can just do that. So if I go to one, it's a little harder, and then so on and so forth. This one is, well, this one is just a balance. So this one's just that balance. So usually I keep this at zero. So this is the tilt. Come on, on luck. Okay. See, so it's so that's at zero. So now if I put the tension on, it's a little harder. So usually on set, I never lock my uh, if I'm not using the camera, I never lock my pan. And the reason for that is if you have your camera here and let's say you have a lock and somebody walks by, they don't see it, they bump the, the handle or whatever, your camera will fall. So if you don't lock it and they bump it, it just turns it. So that's why people almost never lock. And if you're on a really good set and you have a really good AC, they will balance your camera so it doesn't tilt or anything. So half the time, I don't even lock my tilt. Then when you operate, you should never lock any of this. You might be in a situation where you have to lock it, but say 95% of the time, you should never lock it. And it should be built where you're, you know, if, you, if you tell and it comes back, it should stay level. I think the uh, O'Connors or the Sacklers, they're made to where if you tilt, it'll stay like that, or wherever you tilt it, it'll stay like that. So one of the head does that. Uh, and then when you store, when you're done at the end of the day, and you have to put the tripod away, make sure you reset these back to zero, all of them, so that it doesn't fit. Then don't lock your tripod either. Don't lock anything when you store it away. And it's the same thing as before. The reason we do this is so that when you put on your case or your car and it gets bumped, or whatever, it just moves like that. Because if you lock it and it bumps somewhere, it'll break the friction in there and everything. So never ever lock your tripod head when you're uh, when you're done at the end of the day, especially if you're transporting it. And this is this is one thing that people don't really teach you. They just yell at you, thinking you know. So uh, remember that. Never lock it. Even on a smaller tripod like the other one. Uh, I don't know. 20 more minutes. Oh, so I just want to talk more about, do you guys have any questions with the other ones? That lighting, all that? Uh, oh, um, are you, are you going to cover lighting in a future episode? Yeah, in a future one, oh, sorry. Uh, I want to do lighting more because uh, lighting is going to be harder to see doing Zoom. So uh, I'm thinking about doing it on an actual video and it'll just show you, walk you through it. So you, I can show you what the lighting looks like as, as we go on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, oh, go ahead. In the meantime, can I like say like I, if I see a scene that I like, and I send it to you, and then maybe you could like break down how they did the shot or put the yeah. lighting in or whatnot. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So these are just more film lingos and terms. Uh, do you guys know what 86 is? So 86 is yeah. if somebody asks for something and they don't want it anymore. So let's say somebody say, give me a sandbag. No, we don't need it. So hey, 86 the sandbags. That's just me. Forget it. I don't want it anymore. So that's what 86 means. And I'm sure you guys know stingers. Stingers are just extension cords. When you're on a film set, if you're a filmmaker, they're no longer extension cords. They're just stingers. Doesn't matter how long, how big they are. They're just stingers. Uh, reset back to one is if, let's say, you do you do a shot when somebody walks from one room to the next, and you're like, oh, let's reset. So go back to the first spot. That's for everybody, actor, camera, everything. Back to first position. Back to one. It's kind of the same as first position. Sometimes they'll say, uh, let's go to first position. Sometimes that might just be for the actors. And the actors, first position they can. But usually these are interchangeable. So if somebody says reset or back to one, or oh, damn. Just go back to where you started. Uh, talent, 
when somebody says town, they're always referring to actors. I think you guys should know this one. It's, they're like, talent stepping in or whatever, go get the talent. That's always asking, go get the actors. First team, second team. First team is the main actor, the main team. Second team is usually always just the attendance. So uh, if you're lighting a scene, the main people go to the trailers, you light it. Bring in second team, so you, that's the standings. First team is yeah, the real actors. Again, I talk about juicer. Juicer is the electricians. Last looks. Last looks, it's uh, usually for makeup people, is right before you roll. They'll say last looks, so the makeup people will come look at the actor, check them on, in front of the camera, and make sure they look good before you roll. Because usually, I'll, I've been on set where we will be talking about a scene and they'll be doing makeup. By the time you are ready, your makeup, they're going to be sweaty, your makeup's going to be gone, like you're just wasting your time. So usually that's why they have last looks. It's before you start, you know, start rolling there. And usually the AD will call last look and then the makeup person will come and look at it, or even wardrobe, anybody that needs to look at everything. Uh, strike that. The word strike gets confusing. Because as I said in the previous one, when you say strike, sometimes people are turning on a light, a light. But when they say strike that, it means you get rid of the item. So let's say you have a flower in the scene you don't want anymore. Really. Strike that flower, so this means get rid of that flower. So it could be confusing. So if they say strike that, just kind of pay attention to it. You'll get used to it, but in your first couple of times, it might get confusing. Uh, crossing, that's if, let's say you're going in front of the camera, just so that people that don't get confused, oh, why is this in front of the camera? So before you cross the camera frame, you say crossing, and you cross the camera. I have people say you should find a way to always never go in front of the camera if you can, but there'll be situations where you have to go in front of it. So you say crossing before you cross the camera so they know. Flashing is for onset photographers. So if you're uh, taking a photo on set, even if it's, you're not using the flash, sometimes they like to hear it flashing because you click and they hear that. So, but if you say flashing and your camera flashes, nobody's going to be surprised. But if you just start taking photo and they see flash, they might think a light burn out or something. So that's why we always say flashing before you take photos. And this is just for on set photographers. Uh, the martini shot. I think all of you guys know it's the last shot of the day. So if somebody says, this is our martini shot, that means that's the last one. Uh, usually when I work on crew, that's important because my gaffer or whatever will be like, hey, this martini shot, wrap everything else. So I start wrapping. Uh, audition, if you're not actor, you know what audition is, but this is a different term that I'm using it for. If you're on a crew and they say, or yeah, they say, hey, can you audition that? It just means, Try to use it like how you would use it to see if they'll like it. So even as, as an actor, like, hey, audition your hat. Like, for example, in Kong, like, hey, audition your hat off. So you take it off and like, yeah, OK, I don't like it. Put it back on. Yeah. So that's just audition. Same thing with equipment. Like, audition that flag, put that flag in. Uh, Hollywood means you're holding it. <laughs> uh, yeah, usually you hold a, you put a flag on a C stand, and it just stays there. but. Maybe you're in a hurry and like, hey, just hold it with that. We got to go. So you just hold it as a person. So that's what it means. Uh, turnover, this word is not used very often here in America because this is a British term. Uh, the word we use here, actually, I didn't write it down, is uh, uh, pictures up. That's the word we use here. So what that means is that we are ready to go. We are about to roll. So that's what they mean by turnover and pictures up. So as a second AC, remember when I was talking about holding the slate? Usually when you hear the AD says turn over, you, your slate should be coming into frame like that so they know, so they can just draw. Well, if they say pictures up, you should, you should be ready in front of the camera like that. And usually a lot of these are to tell the PAs to tell people around to be quiet. So that's a lot of reasons for that. Oh, I forgot one technique for slating that I forgot to tell you guys. So let's say you slate one apple, take one. They're doing the scene. If you're not, if you could be very quiet, I start with take two. 
if I can't do it quietly. So by the time they're done with that scene, if they want to do another one, you're ready to go. You don't have to think about take two, erasing this. You, you can do that. And I start taking my notes, like this camera, whatever. So that's another one I forgot to tell you guys. So always, once you slate, because once you clap, or once they roll the camera, whatever take it is here, it's done. Even if it's a bad take, even if somebody forgot something, the next one's going to be the next take. So once you're done with this, I erase it, write the next take down. So you're always ready to go. Uh, moving on, I think you guys have heard that. It just means this scene is done. We're going to the next scene. So when you hear they say, moving on, if you're on the same scene, on a slate, if you are, let's just say you did take two and you wrote take three to get ready, and they like take two and I move on. So usually what I do is I just take that, I have to take one. If I know we're still on the same scene, the scene numbers will always increase alphabetically. So you just go one bravo if you're on the same scene. If you're not, then you can they say, hey, maybe we're going to scene three. So you go scene three. Sometimes, you know, a lot of people, if you start a new scene, there's two school of thought of this. If you start a brand new scene, you just start with a scene number. There's no letter. So if you go to scene three, it's just three. There's no A. So after scene three, those are scene three apple. But there are some school of thought where it, is, it should be start with three apple. So that's something you have to communicate with the script suit and even the AD sometimes to see what they like. And usually there'll be an argument <laughs> when they start seeing, right? is that three apple or is it just three? And yeah, so it just depends on the school of thought. So there's two different school of thought. Yeah, so when you hear moving on, that's what I mean. And I talked about Undersling and the Chicago and all that earlier. Uh, so I have more final tip. First tip, safety first. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care how big your budget is, how important somebody is, safety first. Nobody should ever get hurt on your set. Like my friend keeps telling me, we are not saving lives. We're just making movies. And sometimes we're just making stupid movies. Like safety first. Nobody should ever, ever get hurt on set. Safety over, safety overrides everything. I don't care. Uh, the second one is this another one that people don't talk about. When you're an actor, I mean, when you're a crew, try to stay out of the actor's line, eye line, especially if it's during a scene. And I think Sai Kong, I mean, Ian Kong can speak to these, this being an actor. Because it could be distracting, especially if you actually make eye contact and they're trying to do something, they might lose focus. So I always try to stay out of the actor's eye line. Even if they're looking at me, let's say if I'm Hollywooding something, and they have to look my way, I always look down, or like I never look at them, so they, they don't see your eye. And then this one, I cannot stress enough, I always say this, if you're on time, you're late. Never ever be late. If you're on time, you're late. Like these top two thing, very important. Safety first, never, never late. I always try to be early, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, even if you're there an hour before, I don't care. Never be late. Uh, that is it.